everyone, a big welcome back to The Nick Elson Show, Season 5 and Episode 27. Count them. Uh, so we are now in mid-December, uh, even though we're really not recording this on the 2nd of November. You'll always get honesty with me, you know that. But we are in mid-December when it, this goes live, um, and we're kind of hurtling foot kind of foot forward into Christmas period. And I wanted to bring you a little bit of fun in your life today, so I thought no better person than my guest today. It's Sunny Samwell. Woo! <laughs> self applause is massively underrated for sure. so, so before we get into all of this because we will get into a lot of stuff today uh the one thing i do want to say is you guys know that i use this thing called disarming truth i tell people what's on my mind right now so when it's not on me it's on you i don't feel as anxious about it anymore and hopefully you'll kind of get behind me the first thing is this shirt is it looks far more ironed in real life than it does on the on the actual call so if you're watching this in person i promise you i'll buy this t-shirt today i promise you Either way, it's off in my head now, so it's all good. Sunny Samuel, first of all, tell us who you are, what you do, and where you're from. Hi, I'm Sunny Sandwell. I run a company called The Fun Experts. Well, it's called The Fun Experts now, but that's been part of the journey. And I've done that for, um, it's our 20th birthday next year. So wow. Years. Love um, that. Where are you from? I know I don't look old enough, do I? I don't look <laughs> old enough. <at> all. <laughs> you don't. You really don't. <laughs> don't say that, Nick. <laughs> um we are or i'm from um preston ah, um, cool. in the northwest um but the business covers the whole of the country we're here there and everywhere ah i'm heading your neck of the woods later on today actually out to preston brook which kind of more your way than bristol anyway <laughs> that's a runcorn so. uh, runcorn oh okay mm. oh. So is it closer than Bristol? So uh, anything north of Birmingham is your neck of the woods when I start to think about stuff. It's I guess north. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The north. It's like Game of Thrones, really. That gonna... <laughs> the north, the south, the kind of big wall in between. Now that is Game of Thrones. Okay. So I guess the question I want to ask you right from the start, and, and I, I hope you take this in the intention that you know I mean that it's in. Is Sonny your real name? <laughs> That's a question I've been asked for a long time, so I don't take any offence at all. Good. Um, it's my real name. I was born on a sunny day at home where my parents live now, and apparently um, I was looking up at the sun as I was born. And my Love dad um, said, let's call her Sunny, because I wouldn't cry either. And the um, the midwife was trying to get me to cry, obviously, to get the lungs working. And um, I don't have a problem getting my lungs working now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's that's why he called me Sunny. Um, so you could have easily been called Hellstone. <laughs> absolutely, or yeah, yeah. Thunder, or you know, yeah. I did actually try and change my name. I did try and change it at school because my name is Sunny Kate. And okay, I'm going, called, I'm going to be called Kate because I want to be normal. I don't want to stand out for having a, an unusual name. And um, but it didn't work. It only lasted a few weeks because I remember playing hockey and the teacher was shouting, Kate, Kate. I didn't know who she was shouting. <laughs> my friends had to prod me and said, that's you? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful name. It wasn't so much the name that struck me as weird. It was the fact that you are sunny working in the fun industry, which... I just felt just was a real kind of nice synchronicity. So maybe you were kind of, it was a fate thing that you were born into this. I don't know. A few people have said that. It's interesting that you say that as well, because some people say, you know, you look like your name, you act like your name. And maybe that's why I suppose I have got a happy disposition and I see the positive in things. Um, maybe because of that, I, I really don't know. Yeah. Um, my name isn't as unusual now as it was um all those years ago when I was born <laughs> um, because there's a lot there's a lot more of us now I mean, it's funny on LinkedIn actually I'm linked in with other people that are called Sunny purely for the reason they're called Sunny no other reason at all um, so there's a collective but, now is there what's a collective term for a group of Sunnies <laughs> <laughs> I don't know <laughs> I <can> go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we've gone yes, down a really weird rabbit different. hole already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, as people that kind of subscribe and follow and all that jazz that, you know, you know not a details guy, whatever they do to listen to this and watch this, they'll know that kind of the, the whole ethos of the show is to give people the 
the journey behind the brand, the journey behind the speaker, the entrepreneur, all the things that we are in life. Um, so take us right back, actually. Take us back to Baby Sunny. Tell us about kind of growing up, education, family life, and what's brought you to my virtual door today. Okay. I'm actually writing a book on this at the moment, so it's all really? fresh, in, fresh in my mind. Yeah. You heard it here yeah. first. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting little snippets of the book here. Nice. Um, so from an early age, I always knew that I wanted to work somewhere where people were happy. Mm. Um, I don't know what the reason for that was. I don't know. My, my parents had their own business. They enjoyed running it. I saw that they were happy doing what they did. Um, maybe that was the reason. Um, I thought that the answer would be in working in hotels. So people were in the holiday environment. And I thought that maybe, you know, if they're in the holiday environment, then it will be a fun place to work. Um, at college, I went to do a work placement at a hotel and soon found that that wasn't actually the case um, because, yeah, it was a happy environment for the customers, but the, the team behind it at the hotel, it was masks. It mm. wasn't a genuine love for the job. It was a mask for the customers. And so that was the start of my journey, really, realising that it wasn't hotels, but it was something else that I wanted. And I went to um, do a degree in public relations and management studies, um, which thoroughly enjoyed, and then left there to work in public relations. And again, quite, quite quickly realized that that wasn't for me either, because again, it was a mask. Mm. Um, the industry that I was working in at the time, I'm not saying it's like this now, um, or that it's like this for all agencies, but the agency that I worked with, it was very much a mask and you put on a performance and you be somebody that you're not. And I really struggled with that because I'm a very honest, open person. Um, so I quickly left, much to everybody's dismay, including my parents. They said, you can't just leave a job because you, you've got to stick at it, at least get another one lined up. But for me, it was that important that I didn't work somebody somewhere that I didn't enjoy, I left. As an example, when I worked at the agency, I used to look at the car park and see if the boss's car was in. And if it wasn't in, I would skip to work because I really didn't enjoy it. Mm. If, he, if he was there, then I'd just feel a lump in my stomach. And it was nothing against him. It was just the environment, the culture um, that was created there wasn't for me. Um, so I left and um, like I say, caused a, a bit of a ripple with everybody. Um, but for me, I was on a mission and I basically made it my mission to talk to as many people as I could. So I didn't shut down. I opened up. So I spoke to friends, family, neighbours, people in shops, everything, telling them what I wanted to do. And I was in a shop one day and I was looking at the newspapers. And I remember, I think it was a Wednesday. It was a charity guardian um, so it was all the charity jobs used to get printed in the Guardian this day. And so I was looking for it on the shelf and I couldn't see it. And a lady came up to me and she said, can I help you? I said, oh, I'm just looking for the Guardian. I said, it's got the charity jobs in. I got chatting to her. Her husband was the events manager for the Northwest for the NSPCC. Wow. Light bulb, light bulb. And she said, I, I can ask him to ring you if you want. I can, I can arrange for you to meet him and see if he's got anything. And lo and behold, I ended up with a job at the NSPCC. And I worked my way up to being the special events manager. And again, in a happy environment, I was raising money for a fantastic cause. And it just ticked so many boxes for me. I was happy and I was enjoying it. Um, I did that for quite a long time. Um, and like I say, thoroughly enjoyed it. Then I got made redundant and it wasn't a sad time for me because at that time I was ready to move on. I was ready for my next challenge. And while other people were quite sad about it, I was quite excited by the news because I thought, right, okay, where do I go now? Who do I talk to now to find my next opportunity? Um, and that's exactly what I did. I, I got redundancy and um, my, he was my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, um, we both went traveling. We went traveling around the world. I thought, let's, there's no better time. We've no children or anything. There's no better time to get out there and just see, see the world. 
And while we were traveling, um, we got talking about business and we read lots of business books. James, Jim, um, my boyfriend, now husband, was an accountant at the time. So he had a lot of business knowledge and together we just learned about business while we were traveling. Um, and when we came back, um, we decided to set up a company. And the reason we set this up, um, he was still an accountant, this was just for me. The reason we set this up it was I got a bit ill. I had pneumonia and I, I, my immune system was very low and I needed something just to keep me going, keep my energy levels going, but I couldn't go back into a full-time job. While we were, um, when we came back from traveling, we went to a friend's wedding and she asked if I knew anybody that did giant games. And I knew somebody from my days at the NSPC. As, as you do. Because <laughs> she knew that I'd been in events and things. All right. Um, yeah, I was, I was trying to make a link then. I thought, yeah. do you know anybody does giant games? <laughs> but that is a massive well, universal days, kick up the ass, isn't it? <laughs> my days at the NSPC, she knew that we'd, we'd done events. And, and this was at a time when nobody had really seen the giant games. It, it, they weren't in all the pubs and things like giant Jengas, giant connect fours. Nobody did them. And I said, yeah, I do know somebody actually. He's got them in the back of his garage gathering dust. She wanted them for a wedding. I said, I'll go and borrow them. And we borrowed them. And James and I sat there and watched people playing. So all of a sudden, grandma was playing with you know, the kids and the groom's mates were all there. And these games, for such, I mean, the giant games, but for such a small part of the wedding, mm. they were bringing everybody together. And they were really breaking down the barriers because at weddings, you sometimes get that awkward silence. And we just spotted this and we thought, that could be the business idea. That could be the idea that gets me into work. Um, and that was the start. That was the start of the journey. Wow. And it started with just me, giant games, hiring them out to parties. Again, loving my job because I was getting to go to parties and chat to them. And, you know, it, it was great. Really enjoyed it. Um, but then it started to build and started to get bigger um, because, I don't know, we've often thought about this. What did we do different from competitors and things? I don't know. I, I, I did branded uniforms, all a bit makeshift. I got... Mm transfers from Office World and ironed the logos onto jackets. But all of a sudden, everybody thought we were a franchise. And we were called Sunshine Games at the time, named after me by my mum. So she said, she came up with that idea. Okay, let's go. Very it cool. Games. Yeah. Um, but it was all makeshift. It was all me just bringing in external people to organise events. I only had giant games, but I would organise an event where we'd have face painters, we'd have fairground equipment, we'd have inflatables, we'd have entertainers. Yeah, there was just little me with my giant games. And wow. that really confused people. Um, I think in terms of the, the, sorry to kind of chop in there, but I think with the story so far, because I will forget otherwise, um, is an interesting one. So you mentioned the kind of the, the resistance to kind of career or job change from the kind of the, the family perspective. How was the the actual launch again from employment into self employment? Was that I mean, obviously she named the business, but so I'm guessing there was an element of support. Was that a supported move? Do you feel? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've had this conversation recently. Yeah. I've had this conversation recently with my parents actually because no, the the support came from Jim. The support didn't come. From the best place, to be fair. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It didn't come, it didn't come from my family because they were concerned. Mm. They, I mean, their reaction was, why wouldn't people just buy them? Why do they want to hire them? Mm. Um, it's not going to work. Don't get into that. You know, I remember buying our first inflatable um, and my dad saying to me, you don't want to do that, love. You don't want to do that. They're heavy. You've got to wash them. You've got public liability insurance. People can hurt themselves. And it's every kind of hurdle. But actually, I'm really grateful for those hurdles. And I told him that I'm really grateful because by people challenging you, it helps you to define what the answers are and how to overcome those. Yeah. And so I, I really didn't want everybody saying, what a fantastic idea, that's brilliant, and patting me on the back. I wanted that challenge. 
Um, and I wanted to prove them wrong. That yeah, gave me the fact to prove them wrong and that I could make it work. And that has stood us instead for the whole journey yeah. of the 20 years that we've been going, really. is Well, especially the past couple of years, where we've had to be very, very resilient. Yeah. Um, but the yeah. fight's there. And the but fight's there if you enjoy what you do, then why not carry on? Why not enjoy the journey? Yeah, so I mean... I'm, I'm a the... big believer in that. Yeah, and the reason I asked that is because over the course of the last kind of five seasons on here that um, people that have kind of made that entrepreneurial journey, self-employment, whatever you want to call that thing, where they branch out or freelance, that very often there's a, a generational divide as to the approach to self-employment. So actually, like you said, not done with any cruelty, lack of love or intent whatsoever. But actually, it's kind of one of the barriers is that it just it wasn't as common many years ago to, to go and do your own thing, to kind of fly your own flag, especially around something which isn't mainstream. I think that's the that's the other element of it. Is, and I certainly found that when I, I first went self-employed as a speaker many years ago now, that, but, but like I said, that caution, for, for want of a better word, that caution did actually make you kind of take those reality checks. Um, if you were surrounded by people that are going like, yeah, just go for it. You're going to like, right, okay. And then you don't really think about it too much, do you? Um, the other element yeah. that, that kind of of what you mentioned was the, the, the rapid growth of what you were doing. That, again, going by kind of common themes before and, and also in my own experiences, when you first start doing something as, as a passion, you have this passion to create fun cultures, to engage people, to break down barriers that – when you get busy and when you get bigger, did you find some of the shine was taken off of that venture or actually did that just evolve as you went through? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does 100%. Absolutely. So just to explain, so James came to came on the journey with me. Mm -hmm. um, we became Sunshine Events. I'll talk through it very quickly. It's a long journey, obviously. And then we became the fun... No rush, all the, all the time you want. <laughs> <laughs> we became the fun experts in lockdown so we we went yeah. on um went on quite a long journey and i've forgotten your question now Nick. what was your question so in terms of in terms of rapid growth did it change your why did it change the sparkle that you got from what you did no it didn't it didn't Good. at all we because for us when we as we've gone on the journey and we've got bigger and we've got bigger teams and and everything else for us the important thing was that we knew everybody that worked in our team that everybody that came through the door wanted to come to work they wanted to because it was important for us mm. we wanted it to be important for them we wanted them to enjoy it if it wasn't right then we part our ways and there are examples of that where i had one of the team that had worked with us for 10 years she was amazing, absolutely brilliant. I noticed that she started to decline and she wasn't as happy. So I got her into the office and we had a chat. Um, and her passion was in restoring furniture. That's what she wanted to do. I said, that's what you need to do. Mm. That's what we need to do. And we, we supported her. We actually mentored her and, and gave her an interest-free loan because I wanted her to follow her passion. That right. was more important to me than her staying with us and not being happy. Um, so th there's lots of examples where, where we've done that. We've just had one of our guys leave. He's going to be a teacher. He decided in lockdown. He Fantastic. To his passion and be a teacher. Again, he'd been with us a long time. So this isn't, you know, when people come here, they don't have to stay here for life. Just enjoy it while you're here. Mm. You know? um, but for us, the only time, in all honesty, that we lost heart with it was as we were growing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And we would, we almost had a management team in place. Um, everything was in place, and we were told almost we weren't needed as much in the business. It was time for us to concentrate on other things, other shiny things, which entrepreneurs are very guilty of. Doing, <laughs> yeah. <they>? High five! <laughs> we're, like, we're like magpies. Like, what's that? Um, oh, look a pigeon! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whereas I've learned not to do that. I've learned not to to go for the shiny objects and and like I said that for a time at the time for us both Jim and myself was really difficult because the heart we were the heart of the business we loved what we did and and the team were saying that they said it just doesn't feel the same without you mm. you know we, we really miss you and so 
in lockdown, we're incredibly grateful of lockdown because it made us, um, it was tough, don't get me wrong, I'm not, you know, um, I'm not dismissing the fact that it was really hard, mm. but it did make us take a step back and just reevaluate the business and look at what we wanted from the business and streamlined everything and got control again and enjoy it again, love it as much as, as we did. And we're back, we're still growing, you know, it, it, it's absolutely fine, but it just means that it's at a better pace and a pace where, you know, we're back to enjoying it. That's the most important thing for us. I did absolutely. want, um, we once had the opportunity to do one of the biggest events we would have ever done um, for a company. Mm -hmm. And it was all on the table. They booked, um, we'd done all the site visits. But as we were going on the journey, it got harder and harder for the team to do it. They were very hard to work with. The owner of the company was extremely hard and would ring me on my mobile at all hours, um, just making the journey really difficult. So as a team, we decided that we'd tell them that we couldn't do the event. And I rang them and I told them why. I said, because I won't have that impact on my team. Mm. No amount of money would make me put my team through that or put me through it. I love so much to their surprise, um, we said, look, this isn't for us. You know, you find, find another supplier um, because it's not the journey we want to go on. And that shocked a lot of people. That, that yeah. uh, the, team, the team were quite proud that we'd done that because they would have had a really tough year doing that event. It's so refreshing to hear, because like you said, it's easy to to go for the business exclusively, to focus on the commercials, isn't it? But And I'm a big advocate of choosing your clients. I mean, there is a bloody-minded element to that as well. If I'm going to do something for somebody I didn't want to do, I might as well do it and be employed doing it. <laughs> if I'm going to do something for myself, I want to make sure it's on my terms kind of thing. So I absolutely get that. But the fact that you stood your ground and looked out for your team – yeah, that, I mean, that's testament to, to the character. And I guess that you mentioned that how it became difficult when you were both kind of removed or distanced from the team. I guess that's one of the pitfalls, maybe, in a weird way, of of building a, a business which is which you're so heavily entrenched in as the ethos and the ethics and the morals of the business and because there's no one like you in that sense. And somebody was talking to me yesterday about this kind of stuff. And I was saying that I would like to build something which wasn't me, but we're so intrinsic to what we do that it's very difficult to do that, really. Um, working with yeah. Jim or James? Should we go with Jim or James from here on in? Whatever you want to call him. Jim. Let's call him Jim. <laughs> Only because I was listening to a great country Jim. song this morning. There you go. Yeah, there's a great country track that I was listening to this morning saying you don't mess around with Jim. Look it up. It's an amazing track. So you can play it to him. <laughs> it's a great track. Very empowering for Jim. Uh, anyway, so the point is, um, we've spoken to to many people. One that steps out into my, kind of my mind right now, a guy called uh, Mark Terrell, who works with family businesses. That's, that's his niche of the world. Um, and we were talking about the kind of the the impact of working with people that you live with, working with people that you're close to. Um, my own personal experience is that my my family kind of split up uh, in my youth from running a business together, living together, and, and sadly led to its kind of subsequent demise of the relationship and also the business. And I know how much of an impact that creates kind of thing. There's a lot of plus sides that went on before that, but how have you found the experience of working and living with the same person have you been able to put those boundaries in place or is it something that is a challenge at times i feel incredibly lucky to be honest with you incredibly lucky i hope jim would say the same thing i'm sure he would <laughs> that we Look, line them up for a future episode i'll ask him the same question <laughs> <laughs> give a very different answer no I, I i know his answer would be the same because we are the best thing we ever did in the business was split the jobs that we have to do. Mm -hmm. So he, obviously, accountant, he's the business finance mind. I'm more the creative, the sales, the, the products. So we've got very different jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the best thing we ever did. But we complement each other really well. I've yeah. also got my sister that works here. My father-in-law's just retired um, from uh -huh. here. So it is very much a family business. and. I think that helps to create the the vibe that we have. And it sounds, I mean, I, 
when people say, um, you know, the culture that we've created is one big family, I genuinely believe we are a family. You know, we, mm -hmm. we do treat people like a family. Um, for us, that's really important. Yeah. I've had uh, one of the team that works with us has been with us 15 years. Wow. And he came to us as a one-off um he just came to help out at a big event that we were doing. And he had a blue sparkly wig that he'd found in, in one of the prize boxes from the event. And he came and helped me out with stuff from my car as we were, we were unloading for this event. And he stuck with us for 15 years. And now he's one of the management team. Wow. And so absolutely, he's part of the family, you know. And I did, uh, by default, culturally, then brought into the way that you do things over 15 years as well. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, his brother works here as well. Um, and his dad worked here. He's recently retired. So again, it, it's that kind of culture. So are you truly being heard in life and in business? And think about that genuinely. If the answer to that is no, then you've found the right event. If you want to give yourself that boost personally and professionally come along to find your voice live this is will change your life it's, this will be the game changer that you've been looking for it provides me with the confidence in myself to prove to myself that i can do it i can get up on stage i can speak there's absolutely nothing to be nervous about with these events it's very very open very very relaxed help my confidence go from here at the beginning of the day to here at the end of the day Hey everyone, my name is Nick Elston. I'm an inspirational speaker on the lived experience of mental health and a transformational speaking coach. I'm the founder of Forging People and Find Your Voice Live is our flagship event where we cross the boundaries of personal development, mental health, transformation and public speaking. Your ability to speak, to deliver any message to any audience with clarity and power and emotion will have an ultimately defining impact on your success by your own definition of that really subjective term. Speaking is life, speaking is business, speaking is education, and that's the thing that we focus on most. What I find is that people are here for many, many different reasons. Some people do absolutely want to be a stage speaker or a professional speaker. Some people want to be able to represent their business uh, or to lead a team or inspire a movement or create a story. But even actually, some people want to be here just because they want to feel they want to be heard at home. Maybe they, they don't feel their opinions being heard, that they can't say yes to the things they want to say yes to or no to the things they want to say no to. Again, this is where personal development meets mental health, meets public speaking to create a real positive impact. At the end of Find Your Voice Live, you will walk away with massive confidence around delivering your message. The ability to stand up and deliver means you will enhance your self-esteem in an amazing way. You will also have the skills and tools and tips and techniques to not only deliver a presentation, but to structure a presentation, to find your audience, to be able to deliver emotional storytelling to help your audience feel and make them want to be part of your tribe, make them want to be part of their, your following and really tune into what you're truly about, to truly make yourself heard in life and in business. If you're sat on the fence, if you're still not sure, take the model that I use, say yes, worry about it later, and I'll make sure that you're looked after brilliantly. Myself and my team will make sure that you have an amazing day, a transformational day, that will have the desired positive impact that you want to achieve. But I did once interview um, the lady that does our finance, who's been with us quite a long time. But I remember interviewing her and she said to me at the end of the interview, when we said, have you got any questions? She said, I just want to know. She said, do you and James get on? <laughs> That's a great question. Very brave of her to ask, by the way. Absolutely. And she asked that because she'd worked in another company for a couple that didn't get on. They used yeah. to argue and bicker all the time. And she said, I can't put myself in that environment again. That's so a very courageous question. I love that. Very, she very said, I, good. I want to work in it, and it's always stuck with me that question because she was absolutely right to ask yeah, it. Definitely, you know. So you mentioned kind of um, going into lockdown and the pandemic and lots of different things that were happening at the time. And actually, that's the time where we were we were introduced, which is um, so the silver lining yeah. as well. I got to know you throughout this as well. So I think. Exactly. Obviously, both working in in the event space generally, what 
what I found was for about three months after March 2020, everything just died. And and then after three months of doing the right things still, could, even though you're getting no results, I kind of liken it to banging your head against a brick wall, but you're still doing the right things. They kind of switch back on again. What was your experience of, I know the word pivot is a massively annoying word nowadays, it's been massively overused, but what was your experience of evolving into, into the lockdown and pandemic and through that the other side? Um, so because I am a positive person, I think I've blanked it all out, but I, I'll revisit it for a minute. <laughs> um, so, uh, should, start, should, should I get my open therapy white coat on? Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so at the beginning of lockdown, we, the industry, the event industry was hit very early on, um, earlier than a lot of, um, other industries. Um, our business basically just stopped overnight. Mm -hmm. Every call that we were taking was people cancelling their events or cancelling. Um, we put fun into workplaces as well. Mm -hmm. And it was people that were closing their workplaces. So it was like, we need you to come and collect it quick. And um, so it was all very negative phone calls that we were getting. Um, but it was very lucky as well because our customers weren't asking for refunds what they were asking for, they were being very kind, not asking for refunds. Um, what they were asking for is just, can we postpone the event? Mm. Because nobody knew how long it was going to go on for. Exactly, yeah. We, we didn't know whether it was a month, two months or yeah. years. Um, and so that that was a saving grace for the business that really helped us. Um, the, I mean, the, it was a long time, wasn't it? It went on far longer than any of us could have. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and we were told by our accountant to close. So James and I went for a meeting with him and he said, look, you know, very successful business, but because this is happening and this has happened overnight, you can't continue trading, you can't do it. So Jim and I walked out of there and we said, well, the government aren't gonna just let businesses go. There's gonna be something. And we rang our local MP and she said, hold on, hold on tight. You don't need to do that. Just wait. Something will come. Mm. Um, the next phone call we got was um, the, the accountant had lined up somebody to talk to us about um, going into administration. And this all felt a bit quick. This was all in the same day. And we yeah. Thought, hold on a minute. This isn't right. Because when we closed our business, I promised our team, albeit I was crying, I was really upset that we were having to close the business and felt like I was letting them down. But I said, we will do our best to fight for the business and to look after you. You know, just bear with us. You know, we're on a journey yeah. and we're, we're trying to find our feet with it. So we'd gone through that with the team and then to go for a meeting with the accountant to say close, just didn't feel right. It was like, we've been going for too long just to close. So in all honesty, we got rid of the accountant. <laughs> <laughs> I love your way of thinking. <laughs> we did that because it wasn't the right, it wasn't the positive thinking that we needed. Yeah, exactly. For us, we were, you know, we knew we could get through this. We knew that what we had was worth fighting for. Um, and we'd been told that something was on the way from the government. So we fought for it and we fought hard. And, you know, we met. I yep. made it my mission to speak to somebody every day and connect with as many people as I could. James carried on running the business. He would come into the office and, you know, a few people did come in, but obviously it was all socially distanced and everything else. Um, and we just did that. Now, one of the days, it was interesting, one of, my, um, one of my team rang me and I was working from home. She rang me and she said... Um, this is my sister, Camille, who's our sales manager. And she said, there's something on the drive for you. So I went out with the kids because any activity, everyone yeah. was on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was quick, yeah. Quick. Um, so we ran down the drive and there was a box in the middle of the drive. And it had written on it, fun box. Well, like, what's that? And Camille had made us a box of fun, including there was a... A homemade McDonald's in there. It was chips, burgers, and things. So we could even like the little cardboard cartons and things that you put the chips in. Oh, so wow. she made it so people could have a McDonald's at home. 
Yeah. So she put all these like family games. There was all kinds of things in there. And we're like, oh, this is brilliant. This has made our week. This is fab. But from that, all of it, our, our next management meeting the day after, when we're all sat on Zoom and we were talking about this fun box, we said, let's do fun boxes. We can't deliver fun to people. Yeah. Let's post fun to people. So that's what we did. I designed the boxes. We got them printed in the Netherlands, I think it was, and all these boxes arrived. And Camille bought the stock. And, you know, we, we, we all got into action. It, it really sparked our enthusiasm. Amazing. I love that. And so cool. We sent out fun boxes. So people on Zoom calls could all open the fun boxes. And in there, I mean, we had well-being boxes. We had um, circus skills, so people could open these on the Zoom calls and they'd all learn plate spinning or juggling or balloon modeling. But it was a way of us still spreading the smiles without actually having to physically deliver the event. It yeah. was for, as much for our mental health yeah. as it was for the people around us. And it massively ticked the box, it was brilliant. We don't do them anymore. We had to make the decision that, you know, that was a time and a place and it worked brilliantly. Yeah. And you know, for us now, we're back into the, the running of the fun experts. But at the time, it, it helped. We had production lines, especially at Christmas, production lines filling all these fun boxes. <laughs> like Santa's oh, bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elves everywhere. Yeah. Sleighs yeah. let kind of stacked up. Look, love that. Oh, that well. It's funny you say that because as I look out of my office now, I can see sleighs and reindeers as we get ready for Christmas. Um, wow. We, we hire out grottos and snow globes, giant snow globes and things. Oh, for amazing. Well, That's yeah, so, so cool. That so kind of, <laughs> I guess, oh, this, again, there's so many rabbit holes, but I'm not really conscious of time as well. So I, I guess in terms of... Um, Kind of post pandemic, we can come back into kind of the, the real world again, back to in person, back to doing uh, the things that, like you said, that really kind of uh, you wanted to do all the way through. Yeah. We were talking before I hit record today about kind of how there's real common themes that we're experiencing from kind of clients and inquiries and things that actually it's an interesting shift that people now more than ever, ever are looking for engagement inspiration motivation fun um hope even and and like sales but asked to do a, a session on like celebrating accomplishments because we're so busy looking at the rubbish side of life we don't look at the positive side of life kind of thing and all of these things actually mean to me that that's what we're going to need right in the new year going into 2023 actually it's that that bit of a push that bit of a, a confidence boost a bit of fun that we need in our lives how do you how do you deliver fun to your clients? So it's about the employee experience, isn't it, as well? You know, yeah, absolutely. Employees yeah. Employees have a great experience when they come to work. Now, what we're in danger of with, with saying that workplaces should be fun is that people think it, we're trying to create some happy, clappy atmosphere where everybody's <laughs> you know happy all the time. And that doesn't happen. We're all human. Yeah. You know? But... What we, what we say is that companies should have regular fun, not just one thing, not just a pool table that sits gathering dust in the reception mm. and ticks the box. You know, absolutely. That, you know, it, it can't work. There's no long, long, long can't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> Longevity. No long term solution. <laughs> long you are term. right, though. You, you see a lot of people saying, oh, we've got a great culture because we've got a ping pong table. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, not just about it's not about that is it i, I love ping pong as it happens but <laughs> yeah it really isn't about that or it's not about just doing one event a year mm. and all of a sudden we have a fantastic culture because what you've got to do in fact at the moment we're putting together a fun calendar so what we're saying to people is, is just drop things into the calendar so mm. if something doesn't suit one person then it might suit somebody else and you'd hope that at some time throughout that calendar, people will pick up what fun suits them. Yeah. You know, we we deliver equipment to um, it's a big contact center in Manchester, and they have several floors, and they have some of our fun equipment that we rotate each month on each floor. And it's brilliant, it's working fantastic. And they, they've done it for a long time now. Um, but what they find is even though 
because it's a standard joke that finance will never play with the equipment. They always, the amount of customers that say that to me, <laughs> because, you know, they, they've got their heads into numbers. They don't always get a chance to um, come away and have fun. I don't know. Um, but what they're finding is that the finance team are enjoying listening to the teams having fun. They're enjoying the, the, the vibe that it's giving, the atmosphere that it's creating in the offices. Yeah. So it might not be that they play on it. It might be that they watch others or they hear them or, you know, and, and that is having a big impact. So definitely we're, we're doing more and more um, equipment into workplaces, mm. whether people are buying it or we encourage them to, um, to keep it rotating, mm. to keep something fresh um, coming. Or we're doing family fun days, Christmas parties, but it's all things that nobody's been forced to do it. We really don't believe in forced fun. We don't believe in token gesture fun when yep. you tick the box. It's about having it as part of the strategy and as part of the culture, um, because ultimately it improves everything. It, in fact, somebody said to me, it's like the lubricant in a business. And it's so true because it's not fun on its own isn't going to fix a culture. Yeah. You know, we're not that naive to think it's going to fix everything. But what it does is create the lubricant to help it all work together and to, to break down the silos between everybody. So all of a sudden, you do have the MD that's maybe on a, a table football with um, I don't know, whoever, somebody in finance. Yeah. And it stops that barrier because when you're having fun together, it doesn't matter what, what hierarchy you have in the organisation, you're all at the same level. I can still beat you at that game. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you, you're quite right, and, and more power to your elbow. I think we are a product of our environment, whether it's personally or professionally, and and that's huge. I mean, like I said, and, and as part of that kind of culture mix, in, introducing fun the way that you do it, I think is pretty crucial. So if anybody hasn't met Sunny, hasn't connected with Sunny, then I'm sure she'll be happy to hear from you. Um, all of her contact details are in the bio, and please do reach out. Um, what's next? <laughs> I just, that's a really difficult question to ask somebody that's so driven and if you look back over your journey so far the kind of synchronicity of how things have come together for you have, have actually yeah. been kind of half by design half by passion um that what's next have you got any kind of big outrageous goals or ambitions that you want to achieve or directions you want to go in um for the business to continue on the path that it's on we're mm -hmm. more streamlined um, we're providing an excellent service with excellent feedback and on a personal note um, I suppose for us to take more time for ourselves now the business does run itself in all honesty it runs itself it doesn't need James or I as much now now that we've we've put the love into it yeah um, but we can step back a little bit um, so it's not looking for the next shiny thing mm. um, because that's not you know that's not what we want to do but i i think just make sure that we enjoy enjoy what we've created amazing and for the people leaders that are kind of watching or listening to this right now what kind of things can people implement almost immediately or can think things that people can focus on which is going to have the biggest impact the littlest change that can make the biggest impact yeah look i'm more than happy to help people with this mm. even if it doesn't involve hiring from us that's not what it's about I'm on a mission to, to make workplaces more fun. And it breaks my heart if I hear people say that they don't enjoy the job or they're doing it just for the money or, you know, it, I will help people put together a calendar of fun. Um, it doesn't have to be silly fun. Yeah. It doesn't have to be dress up Friday or pizza Friday or, you know, it, it, certainly one common thing that we did see in a lot of contact centers is rewarding with chocolate. Okay. Yeah. There's always tins at the end of every row, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I love chocolate. I absolutely love chocolate, but it isn't the way to reward. Just like money isn't the way to reward and keep your team. It can help. Yeah. But ultimately, it's about creating the right culture. So it can be it can be fun competitions in the office. Yeah. You know, it, there's so many things. And obviously, read my book when it's out next year. Yeah, absolutely. Well. 
that was a, a plug, wasn't it? <laughs> plug away is all good. No worries. I didn't, to be fair, I didn't tell you no plug. So that's on me. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Do buy the book. There you go. That's a plug for me. Um, so I, I think that some of my favorite things I love watching, I, I love kind of like light comedy, I think, because of a. Uh, the, the heaviness sometimes of the space that I work in, I just like kind of comedy. One of my favourite shows is the US Office. And if you want to know how not to inject decent fun into your business, watch the US Office. It's an amazing... Have you ever watched that, by the way? No, I've watched... Well, I, I prefer the English one, if okay. I'm being honest. Yeah. Yeah, I do prefer the English one, but it it is funny. Well, Same principle. Some of the things just aren't appropriate, are they, in the office? No, ex exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Inappropriate fun, which again has its place, I guess, in times, but we'll keep that in our personal lives. <laughs> Guys, I, like you, actually, I think that I do a lot of work in contact center spaces. Well, I think that's actually how we were introduced initially, wasn't it, through the contact center kind of network and stuff. Um, but yeah, so I can also say that rewarding staff with, cho with chocolate is also not good for traveling guest speakers either. So just to throw that into the mix, too. <laughs> So take away temptation for me. Um, but yeah, so I guess the question I want to ask you before I let you go back into the wilds of Preston is this. I'm now the MC of the O2 Arena in London. 20,000 people have paid their hard-earned money to come and hear you do your thing. You sat back in the green room, sipping a Prosecco. You hear me call your name and your walk on oh, music. Your, your song that motivates you, that lifts you, that gets you at peak state. Sonny Samwell, what would your walk on music be and why? I think it'd be Happy by Pharrell Williams. Tune. Very appropriate. I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You do speak, yeah. don't you? So the next time you get a chance to choose Walk On Music, that'll be your track for sure. That'll be the one. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Good tune. Obviously, there's resilience music that I could think of over the past two years. I can see clearly now the rain has gone. Yeah. Um, that, maybe that's one for yeah. all of us. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Most of my resilient happy. music choices are actually kind of explicit rating, so I wouldn't play those in public anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Sunny Samwell, big round of applause. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope everybody else enjoyed it as much as I did. I'm sure you did. Um, so thank you for tuning in. And again, do hit like, subscribe, and all that jazz, whatever it takes to get you back here next Monday. Uh, and next Monday will be the final episode before we close for the, the year. Wow, where is this year gone? Um, and we'll be back in January with another kind of whole host of amazing guests. So in the meantime, uh, stay well, be happy, take care. See you next week. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.